Hello, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. This week, my guest is two-time Emmy Award-winning comedian, Judy Gold. Judy is fitting me into her very busy schedule. This spring, she finished her one-woman show called Yes, I Can Say That, based on her similarly titled book, Yes, I Can Say That, When They Come for the Comedians, We Are All in Trouble. The New York Times called Judy's show a deliberately uncomfortable, laugh-packed show seated with stealth missiles. Time Out said her performance was funny and furious, a testament to the importance of speaking one's truth, especially for comedians. And there's more. New York Stage Review said, Gold is so naturally funny, her delivery and comic timing so impeccable that belly laughs are to be had in abundance. And Theater Mania described, yes, I can say that, as an unflinching defense of free speech. But don't worry, even though that show is over, you can still see Judy live on stage this summer at the Post Office Cafe and Cabaret in Provincetown, three nights a week, from June 25th through September 3rd. And she'll also be in Montreal in July for the Just Laughs Festival. There's more to see her live. Please go to her website, judygold.com. Okay, promo over. Let's dive in. What the fuck is going on, Judy? Okay, Jen, listen. Listen. Um, my So this is my office most okay. of the year, except when my son comes home from college and all his shit is all over the place. Mm-hmm. So that is what the situation is right now. Wait, so you, when he's at school, you repurpose his bedroom into your office? Is that what you're saying? Right. So this is his, this is mostly my office. This, he's going into his senior year, which we're very happy about because that way the office will be 12 months of the year. But so... There's a lot of crap all over the place, and I have to, you know, sort of readjust uh, everything. So that was what was going on. So a lot I of plugs am- get moved. You know, uh, the, the the problem with children, and especially when they get into their late teens, twenties, mm-hmm. is that they seem to think that whatever you own is also theirs. Oh, oh, it's even worse than that, Judy. They sometimes give you the shit they don't want of theirs, no? Right, yeah, we get that. And it's like, because we're not as cool as them, Mm tech-wise, you know? Right. But, you know, when I come home, if I've been on the road or whatever, and everything, it's like, I was afraid of my parents. I know. You know, and I, right? And yes. I and there and I had respect for their things and their property and their oh my god if I move this they're going to know I looked at it and you, none of that there is none of, there's no fear and it's Jen I can't can you imagine going into Ruth's space and throwing your shit all over the place No no I can't I would never go into Ruth Gold's space and just decide, oh, I'm going to take this. Did you Uh, once, though? Tell me what you you must have and got in trouble, no? Oh, I did do one thing. Okay, you need to tell me. Do you know the story? No, but I'm a Jewish daughter, too, so I know you fucking did something. Okay, so this is... Okay. (laughs) I can't believe that we're... I'm even saying this, but... You have to. Okay. So, Jen, I... I don't know. I was in high school. And I don't know if you're Jewish. So my parents, my father was born in 1916. My mother was born in 1922. So they were older. Um, But and I don't know if this is a habit of their generation. I do it as well, which I shouldn't say. But, um, you know, if I went in their drawers, there was always cash. There were like, you know, in the underwear. Yeah, there was cash they had little um, areas where they just hid cash. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. And so I knew my mother's areas, um, her underwear, her lingerie drawer. 
in her um, closet. She had a walk-in closet and in the jewelry box. And when I figured it out in high school, um, I might have borrowed a little bit of money. How to much? maybe buy marijuana. <gasps> I don't know. It was the Wait, 70s. They called it marijuana then. Now they call it like the flower or something. Uh, so you were buying weed. weed. Now it's weed. Okay, you it's bought weed. weed. From who? Who'd you buy it from? I don't know. Some idiots in high school. It was oregano. It's not even close With to your what? mother's money. With your mother's okay, drawer Jen, money. Do you uh, don't understand how long I've been in therapy and I already feel guilty. So I took maybe a 20 <laughs> or a 40 or maybe 60. I don't know. There were $20 <laughs> bills in there. A lot of them. Anyway, so <laughs> I took I took some money. And um, I felt so guilty. Like I could not. The one good thing she did was lay the guilt on to the point of, you know, physical illness. And so I felt so guilty that when she was in the shower, <gasps> what? I went back in the closet to return the money, to put it back in for my babysitting money. So I go in the, in the closet and I open the um, jewelry box and I'm going to put, I mean, it wasn't all of it. I was going to do it, you know, as I made the money. I'm about to vomit to, as you're telling this story. Yeah, I'm so anxious. And, and I go to put the $20 in <laughs> and I turn around and I see this bright yellow bathrobe, which oh was my. my mother's bright yellow bathrobe. Caution. And she Color. caught me. And I, <gasps> and I was like, I'm putting it back. Like, you, and how do you, would you believe that? Uh, I don't, my kids don't steal from me, Judy. So. Okay, Jen, I don't <laughs> need this judgment. Okay. Please don't walk off the show like Monica did off of Terry Gross. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know who else walked off her show? It was, um, who's Gene Simmons. Remember when he walked off her show? That was incredible. She was asking about the makeup and he just walked off. Uh, what about when um, Joan Rivers walked off? Um, uh, what's her name on CNN? Uh, Frederica Whitfield. Really? What? Yes. Tell me what? And it was right before she died. It's a really, on set. On set. She um, Joan had come out with this book and then she was literally harassing her or just focusing the interview on. Don't you think you're offensive? Don't you think you're offensive? And and it was just relentless. And Joan was like, first of all, you don't know how to interview a comedian. I came on here, you know, a, a Saturday morning to talk about my book. And this is what you're, I've been doing this 50 years. And it was really, she was so disrespectful. She got up and I won't watch Frederica Whitfield. Well, I won't watch CNN anymore because of you know what. Yeah, even though they fired the guy. Jen, I am so sick of the way you have made me feel. What what have we been on? Seven minutes. I'm also I'm my kids don't no. I'm my kids don't <laughs> steal from me. Um I'm schwitzing in here. You have your air conditioner on or ruining my podcast. You know <laughs> Oh my god, I'm just so nervous. I'm nervous around people who are funny. Do you think it's because um such an that's such a first of all i applaud your honesty because i do think it's intimidating because humor as i wrote in my book um humor is a coping mechanism but it's also a weapon and so mm, unless right. you're armed in that way um i think people get intimidated and and i also know that and this really bothers me. People will say to me, I don't know when you're serious and when you're kidding. Oh, people say that to me, but I'm you, always serious. Oh, so that means you meant <laughs> that your kids don't steal from you and that I'm a horrible child. Uh, see, my and, delivery sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. No, but, but seriously, I'm not afraid of like you in your book. You talk about the way in your family, when people express their emotions, everyone said, oh, they're just trying to get attention as if getting attention is bad. But you also only wanted to laugh on your own terms because your big siblings like ridiculed you for crying at 
I forgot what you were watching. Oh my God. I was watching Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It wasn't, I think the, the, you know, the fact that, you know, I was six feet at 13, I was humiliated every single day at school. And, uh, you know, you develop, you can either develop armor or you can become a victim. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my mother, you know, I didn't appreciate older parents, having older parents until I got older and realized, wow, I'm, you know, because my partner, Elisa, her parents are amazing, but they were 22 when they had her. And she's like, Uh Judy, I had kids as parents. Um, Mm -hmm. I kind of grew up with them. And my parents were very set in their ways. My grandmother's born in 1896. I mean, she's- What? Yeah, she was there every weekend. We shared a room together. I mean, I had this, such a- a, It was like the Borscht Belt in your living room. I know. Oh my God. The depressed Borscht Belt. And so (laughs) when I went to school and I was humiliated, my mother used to tell me, you know, ignore them, they're jealous. I'm like, Ma, no one's jealous of some of a six foot- tall 13 year old girl, but whatever. And they would te- they would humiliate me and mm-hmm. bully me. And I, in my head, ha- was like, I had agency. I, I thought in my head, Ugh, you're, bu- you know, look at you, you know, but I never said anything. I just ignored them, which in, you know, 30, 40 years later, my th- 30 years later, my therapist was like, wrong thing. You should have used your humor too. So I think that, Growing up in that family where we did not express the only sort of positive reinforcement was a sarcastic comment or a Uh clever quip or, you know, that was better than a hug, you know, getting a laugh uh, from this tough crowd. And then also, you know, being funny and wanting, yes, wanting to elicit the laughter on my own terms. And I think that that because honestly, I would, I'm looking out the window as I say this, but I would walk down the street, I'd hear people laughing and I'm like, oh God, here we go. And I mean, I'm 30, I'm 30 and I still have this, this, you know, thinking that whatever they're laughing about is me. I didn't walk by a schoolyard till I, till I alone until I was a mom. And so all of that, I think, I think be, that helped me to be fearless in a way that, you know, because it, it's hard to be a stand up. But you're inviting it's so I mean, you know, as you're I'm living through childhood trauma as you're, right. as you're talking about, you know, about your being ridiculed, you know, in in sixth grade or middle school. You know, I'm not going to high school. What, K, I would go K through 12. Now I would go more like third grade through 12th grade. Yeah. For me, I think it was sixth grade through maybe eighth, but like in that window uh, is when I developed the eating disorders that I still struggle with the rest of my life, you know, and, 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 you know, it's all very complicated. I mean, you can be a whole person, but then suddenly, you know, you can flash back and you're living in that moment. And that, you know, the thing is, this is why I think the movie, the second time I saw that great movie, um, uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yes. Have you? So there's this scene. Spoiler alert, people! You should have seen it already. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, hello. So, so hello. Um, but there's this, and this doesn't. This doesn't actually affect the plot. What I'm telling you, but there's this scene when Jim Carrey is like going back to his childhood, and he's standing there as Jim Carrey, like a full grown six foot two guy, right? Mm-hmm. And then, there, but he's seeing himself on the playground, or and he's these bullies that he's still seeing them that way. They're, and then you look at them and they're fucking children. Right. And, and I think, you know, I go back to the mean thing, that one kid, I can see him. I can see it. I'm in there in this classroom at this moment. And I'm like, that kid was 11 years old. Right. If he were standing here in front of me and said that, I'd be like, hey, are you okay? What are you angry about? Right. Like, what's right. going on with you? But yet I carry it around throughout, you know, and, and, the, the, and, and, and I... The danger of this is you've been through therapy. You, you know, I don't, I've worked past this, but I know adults, very old, you know, older adults who still, I think, return to that victimhood status and don't realize they've become the bully. Because in this scene, he's screaming at this child, right. right? And I think about, you know, you can think about how they bullied you. I don't know, Judy, I bet there was a moment in your life when you bullied somebody as a child. Do you remember that ever? Or no. do you think of yourself never doing it? I, I absolutely, no. 
Are you sure? I, I am 100%. Do you think you ever heard anyone's feelings in your life? Uh, Jen, of course I hurt people's well, feelings. And now you have a larger profile. Right. And people, because you're famous, you know, you, you know, God forbid you like, what do you do if you ever sent a dish back at a restaurant, if you were short with anybody, people remember that and you don't right. even think but about it. But it's also, you know, you can take that situation and say, what is the person like, and this is the same thing with comedy. What's the person's intent? You know, yeah. um, people take things not the way they're intended in comedy, in, you know, uh, any sort of art, which right. should be dangerous, and in your everyday lives. Yes. And especially in your relationships. Yes. Um, and so I, I am, I definitely never bullied anyone. I, in fact, in, and when I, my, my kids were growing up, I was like, if any kid is being bullied or picked on, you go and you defend that. I mean, I... It was a relentless part of my childhood. And I really, I, I, to this day, uh, uh, I see someone who feels uncomfortable and I reach out to them. I'm that way now, but I have to tell you, I, I, I need to confess to you that I once bullied a kid and I need you to, to hear this because you may want to leave the show. But I was I in, yeah. it's terrible. So a couple things. When I was in like, was it third grade? Mm -hmm. I fell in love with the color black. I wanted to wear black all the time. But of course, my mother wasn't going to let me. And there's this one girl. You're Alexander. way ahead of your time. Oh, my Lord. I mean, I also saw like someone had, someone's big sister had a picture of David Bowie smoking. And I'm like, I wanted to smoke and uh -huh. wear black, you know, but I wasn't allowed to. But wait, so this one girl wore black. Not only that, Judy, she wore pantyhose. I was not wow. allowed to wear pantyhose. At eight you could wear years tights. old? No, this was whatever grade. She, okay. was, she was grown up. Okay. And anyway, so I was, you know, I said to my mom, I wanted pierced ears. I wanted to wear black and I wanted to wear pantyhose. And I think that was, I think she said prostitutes did that. And I thought, <laughs> what's a prostitute? I was like, this sounds like a good, good right. thing. This is a good job anyway, for me. But that, yeah, anyway, so I didn't become one. Um, nothing wrong with sex work, but that was just not my calling. I'm too lazy. Um, but so there's other, so I really wanted these pantyhose and I was told I couldn't have them. I could only wear like opaque uh, stockings, right? And there was some other girl, not the popular girl with the black clothes and the pierced ears and the someone else. And she was sitting on the swings or we were on the swing next to each other and she had pantyhose on. Mm. And I laid into her. This is not, and I, I said, I made fun of her. And I think she told the teacher, I must have been in fifth grade. And I love this teacher. Her name was Mrs. Powell. She was utterly brilliant. She, I lived in Michigan. She'd gone to Radcliffe and she taught us all about oh, like wow. the Neolithic revolution. And anyway, the point is, I remember Mrs. Powell called me over and she said, Jenny, and that's what they called me then. Oy. She said, Jenny Taub, I'm really disappointed in you. Oh. That was it? Stung. And then she t stung to this day. And I never, ever bullied anyone. Did you apologize to, to the, the prostitute? Girl? Yeah. No, <laughs> I don't know. I think I know who the girl was. I think she was a year. He said one of two people and it's either the girl who was very quiet and got a major role in one of the high school plays or it was someone else and I never saw her again. But at any rate. Do you I think dream I about it? No, I'm just recalling it now. But oh, I'm just wow. saying, you know, so what the point I'm making, I guess, is... I bet I really hurt her. And I don't, it doesn't even matter if I apologize. I wonder what that did to her and so on. But that came out of my my envy and my confusion. Um, and that was terrible. And so right. I try to keep that in mind. But, but you're also a child. You know, it's, yeah. it, you know, you think about the bullying. We're talking about bullying as children or, or being bullied as a child. Look what's going on in our society now. We right. are a bunch of bullies. Well, there is a faction, and you can name them however you want, that- I'll name them MAGA, MAGA. That's, that's, yeah, I was trying not to be political. No, but, this is the show, anything <clears throat> goes here. You can say whatever They are so, they're bullies, and their leader is a bully. Yep. Um, and, oh, I love those glasses. I really love those drinking glasses. This, they're from Mexico. Uh, and they don't break. You drop and, them, like, you know, they're like a heavy as hell. I love you, those. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want some? Come over. Yeah. All right. I'll be right there. Um, 
you know, we have we have people, adults bullying and, and their leader is a bully. Um, and it's so interesting because, you know, Mark Twain, I don't know if you heard of him, but Samuel Clemens, I'd like <laughs> to use his real name. All right. Samuel Clemens said. Under the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. <laughs> and that quote is so apropos of these fascists who really cannot deal with satire and humor. Right. And when you think about it, I mean, this is such an old trope. I mean, you know, in, in 1934, I don't know if you heard of this person, Hitler. Um, could you be a little more specific? Uh, okay. First name, Adolf. It's starting to sound familiar. Go ahead. Just Google it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so Adolf Hitler in 1934, when, when, and during the rise of the Third Reich, the comedians, uh, were the first, and the cabaret performers were the first to talk about what was really happening. They were Mm -hmm. on stage in these cabarets speaking the truth. So Hitler passed the, uh, in 1934, the Treachery Act, which um, made telling or listening to an anti-Nazi joke because these jokes and this humor weakened their propaganda. And that's what it does. Humor and satire will weaken the propaganda of these people. So he passed the Treachery Act, which made telling or listening to an anti-Nazi joke an act of treason punishable by imprisonment or death. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was 1934. One year prior, 1933. You're so good at math, Judy. I know. I know, thank you. (laughs) Um, One year prior is when they started banning books. As you're talking, I want, I want to kind of step back and, and, and get theoretical here, because what I hear you saying is that we, you know, we recognize that humor, in particular satire, is a device that you can use to challenge systems of oppression. Yes. Right. On the other hand, or also, um, humor can also be used to ridicule outcasts and reinforce their su- subjugation. Right. Right. I mean, if it's so, used that, if it's, but you know, I'm not, I'm a, not, I'm not against humor, but this is, this is what you talk about when you talk about good stand up, bad stand up, punching up, punching down, no punching at all. Right. Also, I mean, it, it really, I believe, you know, I'm a free speech advocate, as you can see, truth be told, yes. but um, you can make a joke about anything, but the joke has to be funny and well crafted. So when you talk about subjugation and, and, and um, you know, demeaning people who are less than, to me, that's not, that's not good comedy material. That's easy, and it doesn't come from a good place. Right. You know, I have jokes about the Holocaust, but they're, they're great jokes. Um, I love jokes. I mean, I, you know, I love Springtime for Hitler in Germany. Like, right. I can't get enough of that dance number. Right. Um, I went back and watched the whole movie, though, and I'm like, some of it isn't funny. Some parts aren't funny, but like that's, you know, Mel Brooks. And, you know, listen, if you're going to fucking put six million of our people in a goddamn oven or shoot them in the head or whatever right. the hell happened to all of us, and you're not going to let us laugh about it. And and this is the thing. I mean, I, I you know, gallows humor, it's what I was raised on. And like right. I remember you know, a friend of mine in college took some literature class. I wasn't even in it, but she said this one thing that stuck in my mind, which is irony is a discourse of the disempowered. And I thought, yeah. And and I love it, you know, and laughing, it just, it's the reversal and it's, you know, it's what we do as Jews. And you talk all about that um, in your book. And I, I gotta, I gotta go back like a few minutes because the thing with you, you about your mom, and then I want to ask you about being 
Jewish in particular, since you brought Hitler up, because two Jews can't get together right. and I not mean, talk hello. about Hitler. Yeah. Hello. It took a while. Um, but like your mother, um, who told you, listen, don't listen to those bullies. Being tall is beautiful. Can you remind me of what happened at the doctor's office? Oh, my God. Oh, God, I can't believe it. OK, so I I don't even know how old I was, but I was young and I was always, you know, a head taller. By the time I was like in fifth grade, I was taller than my teachers. It was ridiculous. So, (laughs) and you know, having a son now who's six foot eight and seeing, and an athlete. What? Yeah. And seeing his experience versus my experience, it's beyond.com. But so we, she would take me, you know, I would do my annual checkup and she was always very supportive of the tall thing. And so she were in the doctor's office and they, she would be, they would sit there. Oh, you're so lucky. You're so tall. It's, it's such an asset, you, you know, on and on. And I remember one time that my mother said, listen, Jude, I did the talk. And then said, could you just leave the room for a minute? I'd like to talk to the doctor alone. And I said, sure. And I was listening by the door and I heard her say, when is it going to stop? <laughs> and I that's just wanted when to I hear knew you say that again. <laughs> everyone <laughs> is full of shit. Everyone is full right? of shit. Right, right. Oh my God. So what do you do? What did you do with that though? That, I that was must just have been like, a huge... oh my God. So they all know that this is, you, you know, look. I wanted a nose job. She said, you could get a nose job when Barbara Streisand gets a nose job. So oh, that great. wasn't happening. Um, but but why wasn't being tall amazing? When I, we're, I'm just a little bit younger than you. And being tall was what you wanted to be because you want, it was the age of the supermodel. Okay. I mean. I was born in 1962. I grew up in New Jersey in a suburban, very, even though we were, 25, 27 miles from New York City. Yeah. It, you know, you could be 10 minutes from New York City and live and, you know, there's people who live 15 minutes from New York and are like, oh, I would never go into the city. I don't go into the city. It's too dangerous. My mother grew up in Manhattan. So I knew there was another world out there. Um, But it wasn't, it, you know, you're. I was an awkward, tall girl with tomboy, really, with old parents. I mean, I it just everyone else's parents were twenty years younger. Um, my parents' values were so vastly different than, you know, these other kids. Um, my sister Who got your- teased too. I mean, we all. What was she teased for? For being tall, also? Oh no, she was quiet. Um, my mother was, uh, very outspoken. And so when we went to Hebrew school, did you go to Hebrew school? I did. I had a bat mitzvah. Yeah, same. So when we went to Hebrew school, which was after public school, and then you'd go three times a week to Hebrew school, which was torture. Um, my mother was, you know, they would have these, you know how they have during regular school where the parents come in, it's parents' day, and they could sit in the back of the classroom and... uh, What? Oh, God. Oh, as if back of the classroom. Let's put a pin in this and we'll talk about my mother coming on Mother's Day. Sorry, Mom, if you're actually listening, but I I, I warned you that this would happen. I would talk about this. Yes, Mrs. Taub. Um, (laughs) So... We, uh, my sister was in Hebrew school and the kids were just being really awful to the teacher who happened to be the rabbi's wife. Oh, the Rebbitson. The Rebbitson. And these kids were just out of control. They had no respect for her and they were just behaving really badly. And it was the parents' day. And of course, my Uh. mother and one other mother showed up. No one else gave a shit. And my mother went in front of the class and (gasps) screamed at them. Oh, Judy. And my sister's class. This is my sister's class. And, you know, that was pretty oh much God. the end for her. Um, yeah, I mean, none of the kids would talk to her anymore, right? Right, that. that was, yeah. <laughs> and she was, how <laughs> dare you? But my mother was fearless. Yeah. You know, as far as when it came to, you know, doing the right thing or 
or standing up for the, you know, yeah, she she definitely and, you know, we wanted to, especially being a big person who takes up so much room. It's like, no, I don't want more attention drawn to me. You know, why couldn't uh, the Rebbitson control her own classroom? Who though? the hell knows? Who uh, the- I mean, because I got to tell you, I wouldn't have yelled. But I would embarrass the fuck out of my kids because if I went to a, like, actually I wouldn't, but I have been in situations where the teacher is not managed in the classroom on parents night and I'm just cringing. And the last time I saw that, that teacher ended up quitting because she couldn't like handle the kids. But like, you know, Hebrew school is famous for people who are leading it, not knowing how to manage the kids. Plus the kids are exhausted, but they've they've already been in school. Right. Right. And... This was Hebrew high school. So this was oh. like after your bar after? bat mitzvah. Yes. Oh, no, that's not. No, 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 oh, no. no. We when had you, to no, go no, to, no, 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 no. Yeah. After you're done. That's no, it, yeah, no? no, weren't done. So they really didn't want to be there. Oh, um, that's more understandable. Yeah. But what happened was the silver lining is that all the kids quit Hebrew school, except for my sister. So she oh, won no. the uh, scholarship to go to Israel. Uh, that year for six weeks. And uh, they complained. They're like, well, she's the only one left. Why, you know, weren't, you know, she shouldn't get the scholarship. And of course, my mother. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, the fix was in. She yeah. scared all the kids yeah. off so your sister could get but it. But it was all, I don't know how, did you walk to school growing up? So, I, oh gosh, no, because my parents uh, sent us to private school. Mm, um, Mrs. Chan, yeah. very nice. Yes, uh, we, yes, it was a, a very fortunate experience. We went to the school that Mitt Romney had gone to. Oh, um, lucky you. But, uh, you know, it was, yeah. but, no, it was a very good experience. Of course. But the neighborhood we lived in, my first neighborhood, um, because we were in private school, the other parents told the kids in the neighborhood that we were mentally deficient you know, the word they used back then was retarded. Yes. I um, and so it was hard for us to find friends. I did have one. I did That's have one friend need. from that neighborhood. But did you have a friend? Who was you? You must have had a friend. I had friends. I had my neighbors. Um, yeah, I had the people who, yeah, who lived in my neighborhood. And then I'd ride my bike to my friend Liz's house. You know, yeah, I had a handful. Uh, but school itself, what, you know, no, I was in the marching band. I was very into music because I tried out for the basketball team when I was in seventh grade. And the coach said I was too tall for the team and it wouldn't be fair to the other players. OK, that's fucked up. This is exactly how your son's life is different. Right. Who would say that? Him. And he and he apologized like recently within the oh, past great. few years. I mean, I'm 60 and he finally apologized. Um Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, but when I, I walked it for, from K, well, from one, first grade to eighth grade, I walked to school because it was five houses down the street. You're so lucky. Right. But anytime there was a weather, you know, like a storm or you know, anything, they would get on the loudspeaker. And who was the first? Per- Judith Gold. Please come to the uh, office. Your mother is here to pick you up. Like five oh houses. Down. She was the first one to bring me home. Now, I want to talk about the First Amendment, but we've got, I, I've right. got to talk about my mother. She's like fabulous. I Shelley's love your amazing. Mother. But here's the deal. First of all, the private school they sent me was like Wasp Central. Right. Like, you know, so you, you see were my the hair. only J? Well, I was, no, there were some Jews there, but I didn't know, I didn't have as many Jewish friends until I was in college. And my hair never, didn't look like this in high school. This, see how it's kind of wavy? Yeah. It was in a blonde bob. Because. What? Was, I was it blonde? trying to assimilate. Oh, yes. First with sun in and then eventually with expensive highlights so that I could assimilate. Right. And was this at your mother's? No. That was you. Me. I'm the only, so I was trying to pass as a wasp. I have blue eyes Mm -hmm. and I felt like it was my obligation then to make my hair blonde. You know, I don't know what the fuck. And your mother went with it. No one's going to, you know, this thing about Judy, it's better about me, Judy. It's like, it's best that you just go with what Right, right. And let you (laughs) figure it out. Okay. My family was good that way. Okay. Um, But, uh, you know. You know, but they certainly paid for the highlights. Whereas if when I wanted to play football and Little League football, they didn't go with that. So right. let's just, you know, 
it was okay. Um, okay, so first of all, there's that setting. Then we get to, and like a lot of my friends were, you know, waspy kids. And uh, anyway, so, and my parents would sometimes say, oh, those people don't want to. How come those people haven't invited us to dinner? It's because we're Jewish. And I thought they were paranoid. And now I look back on it and it was like, yeah, probably. You yeah. know, I, I was naive about that, you know, but um, so on one, we'd always have the parents visit. And I remember it was junior year of high school and I was in AP American history. And we were learning all about the Vietnam War. And I'd already heard my parents at home say, because by the way, did I mention they were Republicans? Jewish Republicans. Okay, I got to go. I'm really busy right now. <laughs> okay, wait, 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 wait. Still? So it gets better. So they, uh, no, Mrs. well, Tao. my mother, no, 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 no. She, she did not vote for Trump the second time. Thank, oh God. Okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. It's okay, listen. All right. She can't you stay. know oh, what? I can't. Listen. I got it. Okay. okay, okay. So, but here's the good news. The good news is I tried to head this off at the pass. So I had heard at home my parents say things like, we should have just won the war and bombed them, whatever. Like, and I had already learned in a history class that there was no way to win this war. Right. And that we needed to, like, get out of this terrible mess. From um, that same teacher. That, yeah, from this teacher. So she comes to school, yeah. first of all. she As she gets ready, I see the bag. And this bag is the needlepoint bag. Oh, yes. She had... One bag where she had a needle point in it, and it was of the Cranbrook. The girls' school was Kings, or the boys' school was Cranbrook. And it was the Cranbrook seal. Like the this is the thing. The boys, uh, not motto. Well, the motto was aim high, and their mascot was an archer pointing mm-hmm. to the sky. Okay. Our the girls for Kingswood was enter to learn, go forth to serve, and oh, ours God. is a tree with roots in the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. So hmm. she's got the archer. Now, is that still you, the my, situation? By the way. There? Well, they are co-ed now, okay. and of course, and they completely allied Kingswood. Okay. So now it's just Cranbrook. Yeah, okay. so we just disappeared. Um, okay, so, but we had co-ed classes mm-hmm. at that time. Okay, so my so my mother brings in, you know, point. Now, mind you, I'm in junior year in high school. My brother's, all, older brother's already off at college. She's been working on this fucking needlepoint since there was a parent's <laughs> visiting day. So I'm like, Mom, why do you only bring the needlepoint? And now I understand because she's bored out of her fucking mind. Right. It's good that she has a needlepoint. This is, you know, what? Fine. But I gave her two things. One, please don't bring the needle point. I gave her. Right. And I said, or, and I said, please, I said, also, don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> and so she brings a fucking needle point. And right. the minute we get into the Vietnam thing, you know, she's like, fucking shit upon them. They don't no care way. about their own people. Whatever it was. And I, th- I thought I was going to die. And all of my friends are, are, you know, Democratic wasps for the most part. Right. You know, Carter voters. You know, this was the Reagan era. Yep. You know. Anyway, so it's okay. I love you, mom. You know, it's good. You know, this is a whole thing, though. Thank God she did that, though. Like, I sh- I learned that I was not going to silence her. And she learned right. that she was not going to silence me. And we had, you know, intense arguments at the dinner table. Um, and we always kept the dialogue open until Donald Trump was elected. And that was the only time I stopped talking to my parents for a period of time because I couldn't handle it. I did. I had a relative, too, I could not speak to. And I hated that period of time. It was um, so, it's so, um, it's such a weird feeling where, I mean, I had felt this before as a gay person um, when I knew people were voting for a candidate who didn't believe that I should have equal rights. And especially after I had a child, my first child, oh, you right. know, that, so you're voting for them because of your taxes and yet I you're you're voting against me. It's a per, it becomes a personal thing when part of their uh, platform is to take away rights from me or not give me rights or not validate my family as a real family. And so mm-hmm. I had a really hard time with that. And then when Trump became president, I, I mean, the fact that character d- didn't matter, that if, if we behave, if I had behaved, if your kid behaved any like that, I mean, you're representing this country and you're a liar and a philanderer. And, and a rapist. And a rapist. And a cheat. Right. And a vulgarian. It, Nothing good And about a traitor. Him. It's like, right. that's, Yeah. Okay. 
So All yeah, right. I mean, I'm glad we're that with that. But let's. But 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 this is the thing, though. Like no one, people said what they wanted to say in my family, and we could debate things and change minds sometimes over time. And I'm pleased about that. And I, you know, I that we we do share a distaste for corruption and vulgarity. I thought and other things. Okay, now though, let's get back to the heart of why you're here, which is to talk about your book and your you, one woman show that you just finished. Yeah. On the same topic, which is, yes, I can say that. And I love your book because there were, I mean, there's something, you know, I I recognize some of the names, but there's a lot that I didn't know about the history of comedy. Like, I'm embarrassed that I'd heard of Lenny Bruce, but I didn't realize that he had been convicted so many times. Yes. Um, And, you know, there's, and, you know, I loved reading your, like, I always check out the acknowledgments first and like, you know, your acknowledgments, it's like, you, you think every single fucking comedian I've ever heard of. So like, I'm thinking, do you all summer at the same place or do they no. all come see your show in P-Town? So how do you know everybody and how do you have each other's backs? Is that part of what this is about? Well, or don't you actually know them and you just thank them? Oh, uh, so? yeah, right. Uh, well, first of all, Jen, I've been doing this for 40 years. So I know, you know, I know everyone. I The newer comics, I don't know. Uh, and there's so many more now. There were not that many. We were a very small, tight knit community. And, uh, now there's a lot more and a lot of people are comedians now because they made a funny video on the internet, not because they were, oh, so, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I love that. What song is that? You don't know the you song? You can answer the phone. No. It's fine. Are you sure? Who is it? You don't know a song? <gasps> yes. It's you, girl, and you should know it. Yeah. Love is all, Love around. Is all around. No need to waste it. You can ha- it's the theme of the it's Mary, Mary Tyler, Tyler Moore. Moore show. I love that show. She was the first career woman I could I know. identify with. And single. Um, yeah, that's my <laughs> ring. Um, and I still don't hate it. And it's been years that that's my ring. What the fuck were we talking about? Oh my god, you've forgotten what we were talking about. Your phone rang. Oh my, fu- my. Um, oh, comedians. My show, that my been... show and the comedians. Your show. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, that, oh yeah. I know, I know, I know. You said people who are younger sometimes they just get famous. Right. Be a so we have they do now. Check on TikTok. Right. So now we have people who become have a viral video and then go into the comedy clubs and are headlining because they can sell the seats and don't know what they're doing. So I came from a time, I started in the, um, my first set was when I was, was 1982. I was 19. Um, Where was that? Because I wanted to ask you. Rutgers College. Uh-huh. Rutgers. No, I was a student. Someone dared me to do stand-up. That's how it, it all, it was Secret Santa. My friend Howard uh, was my Secret Santa. And he made, it, he, my note said, you have to do five minutes of stand or 10 minutes stand up and use everyone who lives on the floor as material. And that did was you? it. Yes. How was, did people laugh? Well, I, I did my first joke. I have a picture of it and I can't, I need to know about um, your first joke. My, I, I did my first joke, which I, I think it was about one of the Orthodox Jews on the floor who went home literally for every, every minor hot was like, I'm leaving for whatever. In September, there are a lot you've never heard of. Yes. And so uh, I think it was about that, but I got my first laugh. laugh, And I'm telling you, it was an out-of-body experience. It was like my something, I epiphany. It was, I had never had that feeling before. And I was like, oh my God, this is what I'm meant to do. And I never, to this day, I still love it as much as I did day one. It's just in my blood. So anyway, when I started, you know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have um, the internet. We didn't, I, I tell this often when I would go on the road, I had one suitcase that was like my junk drawer because <laughs> we could, you couldn't use the hotel phone. It would eat up your entire salary. Um, so, so I- quarters just thrown in there. Huh? 
tons of quarters. No, in there? the ho- oh. the phone in the hotel room was lo- it was like a dollar, two dollars a minute, and at that oh time, God. yeah, it was ridiculous. So I had this suitcase. I had books. I had a, mm. a two cup coffee maker from Zabar's because there were no Starbucks. There was nothing. I oh. had um, my clarinet. I oh would bring my God. because you you know you're working right. for an hour. You know, at, at not not really working. You're working, yeah. you know, the entire time. But you want those shows to be, you know, we really wrote. It was a, we're trying to be a better comedian. Um, so I started with, uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to watch these masters do stand up. I Belzer, Richard Belzer was the MC yes. at Catch a Rising Star. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I used to go on Monday nights to try to get on, and um. Oh my God! I saw Larry David and, um, <laughs> I, you know, um, what's his name? Oh God, damn it, Judy. Um, uh, that guy. I know who you mean. Neurotic, uh, Richard Lewis, and oh, um, yeah. you know, it was just, it was, uh, you know, Paula Poundstone, um, Elaine Boozler, Carol Leifer, Joy Behar, Susie S. It was. Uh, It was a master class for me. Um, And I would go and hang out trying to get on. And of course, you know, I get on really late and the band, they had a band. They told me I was funny. Whenever anyone who works in a comedy club says you're funny because they've seen it all. Um, So that's sort of how I started. But, uh, you know, there has you has it changed? I mean, oh, my God. Jen. Not just the profession, but you like, do you nap always before a show? No. Like, what are the things that, no, you don't, you just go. Oh, okay. no, I don't nap. That will, no, I meditate. But how do you get ready? Okay, so you meditate. I do meditate at one point during the day. I have to sort of meditate. Um, you know, for stand up versus my one per- So, my one person show, based on the book, yes, I can say that. Uh, when they come for the comedians, we're all in trouble. But the um, the <laughs> nice subtitle that's my subtitle. But yeah, but the the show was just yes, I can say that. And B D Wong was mm-hmm. my director. Um, Amazing. And I wrote it with my friend Eddie Sarfati. And you know, B D really helped in the development process. You know, I thought, oh, taking a book and making it into a show. Sh- you know, here I have this, I have it all written already. Not even work harder, harder, because you want to make it a living thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and also you want to learn something on stage and you want to tell a story and you don't want to be academic or make it like a Ted talk, you know? Yeah. So I had to make it really personal, which BD was instrumental in, in in achieving that. Um, but, uh, you know, for that it's, it's takes, you can't, you can't lose focus at all for those 80, 90 minutes, you know, so that's why I how have to. How long is that, though, compared to stand, a stand-up stand show? Stand-up, I'll do, it depends. Like, if I'm out doing a set, I'll do 15, 20 minutes. But <gasps> if I'm headlining, oh, okay. and, and, you know, if I'm out doing a set here in New York, it's just, mm-hmm. you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and I'm hopefully working out new material, too. You know, you think about the, the art of stand-up. I mean, the show is written, and it is yep. done the way it is written. Stand up is the only art form where the audience is the vital element in the creative sure. process because I can sure. sit here and write all day and then I get on stage and they're like, no. And, well, you have to, yeah. It's 90 minutes. Well, 15 minutes is, is easier to keep your energy than 90 minutes to keep it going. But oh, then again, I, you don't I, have much time. I, I like doing an hour. It's so hard though. I like yeah. doing an hour, an hour 10, an hour 15 yes. of stand up because yes. I know. I can pace myself. Yeah. You know, 15 minutes, it's so hard because, and there are some shows, you you know, when you do a set on a TV show and it's four to six minutes, that's the hardest. Of course. Because they want a laugh every 20 to 30 seconds. And no, you know, it takes a while for, you know, to get into a rhythm and, and, you know, you're, it's like you're an orchestra, orchestral conductor in a way. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, they have to get used to the way you are communicating and you have to connect and, you know, and TV every audience is, the is worst. different. Huh? The TV, shows, the TV show has to be the worst because 
you have on the one hand that live audience there, but right. you have a bigger audience. It's kind of like when we were doing hybrid teaching. Right. And it's like, wait, like, because I have an hour and 15 minutes to teach a class. And I know if it's just in the classroom, I know how to get the students engaged because I, I actually try to get them laughing. Right. Because if they say, you know, you get them into the thing and it helps, you know, the, the sort of pace, the rhythm, the, the callbacks in even learning. But when we were doing the thing where you're like, some people are at home and some could be in the classroom. It's like, who am I talking to? The people well, at home? It, and or am that, I talking to people in the room? Yeah. And well, that in suck that when case, you're on TV. Yeah. You know, you're supposed to do it for the TV audience because those yes. are the, that's who's really watching the studio audience, whatever. But. How do you do that when you're not getting laughs from the studio audience? And also, whoever went on before you, whoever. That's what you said with the Leno thing. That right. story you told. That's, that was, you know, I, I'm doing Leno. I had done Leno as a panel guest, which was great because I can sit and talk to you and, 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 you know, we plan out the bits and I tell the funny story. I mean, that's, I'm very conversational in my standup. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, th- the thing that works you know, comedians who do set up punchline, those are the best comedians for these shows. Um, but I did do, yeah, I write in the book about how I was uh, scheduled to do, I was booked to do stand-up right after John McCain was interviewed uh, to apologize for something he had said uh in the news, that was that was the big news story, and he was on there. He is not a fluffer, my God. Yeah, and so he's up there explaining um, this faux pas and apologizing, mm-hmm. and it's very political. And then it's like, here's your tall Jewish lesbian. I don't even think I was out then, but <laughs> you know, here's a tall Jew screaming at you. Yeah, it just was. It's so hard. Yeah. And that's also why when we book these inexperienced comics who need to get experience to, you know, yeah, they need stage time. But, you know, cure the, people don't curate shows. The Comedy Cellar definitely curates their shows. Um, but, you know, you need to, you know, does this work with that? Is this co- comic going to, you know, their their style or their topics are going to fit with the headline, you know? That we need more of that. So one thing, which is like the whole damn point of your book, is 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 freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. And I'll, all I've mentioned though is is Lenny Bruce vaguely, but I want to talk about where you kind of start. Yes, Mrs. Um, Taub. <laughs> no, Professor Taub. Professor, I'm sorry. Mrs. Taub is my mom. Okay, Judy. That's Shelley. Does she? Um, t- does Shelley? Is she like my daughter's a professor and she has a podcast and she's an animal? She doesn't have that exact accent. It's more of the Midwest. That would be like the other generation. All right, can you do it? Can you do her accent? I I don't. I I can't. I can't. But um, I don't do accents. But you do an incredible Eleanor Roosevelt. I I feel like I need to hear that again. Yes. Okay. (laughs) I played her in a in a musical. I love her. I love her. Okay. uh, Go ahead. She's great. Did she do, like? Did she tap dance in your role or? Uh, no, this just talk? actually, she did not. That would have been um, wild. so. The whole okay. point of this is is, is is the freedom of speech issues around um, not just the the most debilitating aspect where we're literally banning books like out of out of Texas and Florida, but the kind of self censorship, the canceling comedians, including our our uh, mutual friend Kathy Griffin, um, who is back on the road, but also people like Louis C.K. come up in your book. Um, and now recently, I don't know if you saw this, but the woman who wrote that book, Eat, Pray, Love, has now pulled a book that she has. Um, and so I, I just want to hear your thoughts on where we are at this moment, um, where, you know, as you say, comedy is a space where you you should be able to tackle all kinds of topics, um, as long as your jokes are funny. Right. Um, but yet, Tell me what you think is going on in terms of self-censorship and in terms of cancellation. I I, want to hear your take. Well, first of all, I just want to say I I am a board member of the National Coalition Against Censorship, and um, they deal a lot with these book bans. Uh, This is just a repeat of history. But, you know, I I was at the uh, Moon Tower Comedy Festival in Austin, and they were having a librarian convention at the same time. And I, I was speaking to <gasps> I one of it. 
the librarians who told me that she gets books back with bullet holes in them. Bullet holes. Wait, what? Yeah. Fuck. It is this anti-intellectual, you know, I believe in more discourse, not less discourse. Um, When you think about Lenny Bruce and you think about George Carlin and you think about Joan Rivers, um, Richard Richard Pryor, Pryor. uh, you think about these people who really, you know, George Carlin is constantly quoted today. Videos of him are on, you know, social media today because it resonates. Richard Pryor, when George Floyd was murdered, the number, you know, one of the top 10 downloads the following week on Spotify was a bit that Richard Pryor had done about the cops and, um, and, and black people that he had done in like 1978 still resonates today. I think that what I, you know, first of all, I think all of this, I'm offended. Um, we can't say this. You can't say that. I, what I don't understand, and I, talk, I say this in the book, is that when you take intense, intent, context, and nuance out of the formula, you have nothing. And so if, if a comedian who is trying to make you laugh tells a joke that you find offensive or uses a verbiage that you think is, you know, abhorrent, then you don't have to listen to that comedian. But that doesn't mean they should not be able to do their art, that they should be canceled. We have legislators. We have people who are uh, elected officials who say the most disgusting things, who incite violence, Mm -hmm. who cause death, literally cause death and destruction. And yet they keep their jobs and they keep their microphones And yet a comedian who offended you, my friend Eddie said, and it's the first quote in the book, Mm -hmm. going to a comedy club and expect or getting upset that you got offended is like getting on a roller coaster and getting upset that you got scared. It is part of the art form. The art form that I said needs an audience. No other art form uh, do you have, like Van Gogh never stopped mid-painting, looked out to the crowd and was like, who wants another sunflower? This never happened. <laughs> you know, Leonard Bernstein was never, you know, conducting. But actually, that- actually, on the haystacks, he did ask, do you want another haystack? Oh, really? Didn't he do haystacks? Am I getting him confused? Okay, know. anyway, go ahead. Jen, I can't. George Burns, though. No, uh, no, Leonard Bernstein. Oh. You know, he never, Bernstein, he yeah. never... You know, look to the insurance adjuster in the third row and was like, too much oboe? What do you think? No. And so, you know, here we are. We are the truth tellers. We have such a weird relationship with the truth in this country right now. Um, and yet we we are the ones being attacked because we're powerless. And yet the truth is, I mean, why do you think Trump couldn't go to the White House Correspondents' Dinner? Um, mm-hmm. Comedians. Well, he doesn't want to be humiliated. Right. He can't stand but he's it. fine to humiliate other people. Exactly. And no, call them absolutely names. absolutely true. Um, mm-hmm. But he can't compete with a master of satire and humor and the truth. He doesn't, you know, and most dictators, fascists, know the power of comedy um, there are a number of comedians who Kasha Zwan was um, an Afghani comedian who was murdered by the Taliban. And yeah. when he um, they the Taliban made a video of his execution just so they could get more followers on TikTok. And he is oh. seen mocking them and making jokes up until the very end. That is his weapon. Um, there are comedians who are jailed. Um, a North Korean comedian there, you know, we deal with this all the time over a joke. If you don't like what a comedian is saying, then just then like, you know, I use this example in the book about, you know, 
my friend going to a concert and wanting to hear all these old songs that she grew up with. And instead it was a new album and she didn't really <laughs> like the song. It was Jackson Brown, yes. right? And she was like, oh, I, I went to see. And does she say Jackson Brown should never be able to perform again? Every joke no, miss- is not about you. You know, social media did right. this where now every moron's opinion is equally valid. But no comedian was thinking about your childhood trauma when they wrote their material. Right. And words have different meanings for different people. And my life experience, that informs my comedy and what I'm going to talk about. Your life experience, your 20 years on this earth where you have decided we can't say this or that. Sorry. You know, it's like, and I think, yeah, I think it's so important. And I, you know, I think as I was reading your book and thinking about our conversation, um, you know, there are places, you know, talk, people talk about safe places, free speech feels safe to me. Being able to say what you want to say when you want it, because being silenced right. is feels literally like death, not just like the AIDS silence equals death, but for people who express themselves and process the world through language, not to be able to say what you want to say is, 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 is hugely oppressive. And there's a world of difference between being on stage in a comedy show, someone pays for a ticket, they come watch, versus someone, like, like for example, if you were invited into someone's home, a friend invites you over and their family is over there. You don't break into jokes in that situation. Right. I mean, in other words, I, and I think the problem that, you know, this whole time, place and manner, it's a, it's a, it's a doctrine in free speech, but it also applies to common courtesy. Like you're not like the kinds of things you're going to grapple with, tackle with jokes you're going to tell on stage in a comedy show is different than maybe someone would have in an office um, if they work in an accounting firm. Right. Very different than what I would do in a classroom, right? right. To be inclusive in a classroom, I'm going to make different choices than you would make on stage, right? And yet there are some similarities, though, I think, in the way that people do self-censor. And, I, and I, I'm concerned that, um, again, uh, you know, how, how do I put this? Um, I'm just trying to think of the, it's the, I guess the metaphor that at the beginning of the book, you know, if you go to a comedy show, you should expect to be, you know, right. insulted, challenged, just like if you go to a roller coaster, you should expect to be scared. To be scared. The question is, um, what about other places? And have you given thought to, well, well, you know, look, to that? You can break that down. When I'm booked on a corporate gig, um, I'm going to do material that is appropriate for the audience. When I'm on stage and I'm feeling out what's going on, I know what jokes to do. I know how to approach it because I've been doing it for so long. My sure. line, the line, which George Carlin famously said, uh, it's a comedian's job to cross the line, or he likes to cross the line um, deliberately, make the audience and make the audience happy that I did. And I love that. Right. Yes, that's a good point. And bring them along. Now, you know, we're always editing on stage because we're feeling out what works and what doesn't work. Um, But, you know, of course, you read the room. We all read the room. We all have to also address the elephant in the room. Um, We know how to behave. And you have to take responsibility that this is your triggered. You heard a word you didn't like. Is that what the comedian intended? Uh, no, it's what I, it's what you heard. And that doesn't mean it's just like this idea of banning books. And the one parent doesn't like the book so that, you know, one parent didn't like Amanda Gorman's book, even though she didn't even read the whole thing. But she right. read one line in a poem she, why does she get to ban books for all of these kids? Right. And that's what's happening. And this cancel culture and giving these people power um, when we really should be talking about the fact that there's so many little kids who can no longer read those books because they were shot in their classroom. Mm. It's... And I would go farther, too. It's not just what people say on stage. I think it's really important to separate an artist from their work. Yes. Like, my favorite poet is still T.S. Eliot. I know he is a raving anti-Semite. That was stupid of him to be. Coco Chanel. But doesn't change. Does that, oh my gosh, Chanel? Now you tell me. Chanel was embedded with the Nazis. 
Oh. I mean, you go to synagogue. Not that I can afford any Chanel, but but if I could. You know, Coco was was literally a Nazi, you know? Right. I mean, you know, look, like, and so I make the choice, you know, whether I'm going to read that work. And I I feel the same way about Woody Allen did atrocious things in his life. But I got to tell you, I love so many of his movies. Right. And his and his writing. The only he's, one I he's can't a, separate what? because I think comedy stand up is such a personal art uh-huh. form. The only one I can't is Bill Cosby. I cannot. Well, yeah, no, but yeah. he was not to me. I know you think he was funny. I, I never thought he was all that yeah. funny. So it's easy. I mean, for he me. was a he was a great stand up, but no. And oh, and I and, can't and even again, listen to Michael Jackson after. Uh, I mean, I can listen to the Jackson five, but when I listen to after when I knew that, you know, when I know now that what was going on, I, yeah. So, but this is hard, but I don't judge if any, you know, anyone listening, if you can't listen to that or read that or or watch that, bless you because you draw your lines, right? Like, I think that's important. It's a personal thing and don't impose it on other people. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And and there are so many, especially today. Back in the day when I was a kid, we had three stations on the television. Right. You had to get up to turn it. Oh, three, was it four? ABC, well, NBC, it was a, CBS, it was CBS UHS, right? Well, I had, and I'm older yeah. than you, we had um, Channel 2, which was CBS, Channel yep. 4, which was NBC, Channel yep. 7 was ABC, Channel 9 was WOR, and Channel 13 no. was PBS. Yeah, we only had a fourth channel being out in the Midwest. And mm-hmm. my father had to stand up, hold the oh, rabbit, that rabbit ears. ears. And sometimes yeah. if you step away, you couldn't or see what was going on. Put tinfoil on them. Yeah. We were more captive. There was not much to watch. Right now, People read, I, mean, I don't even know. Jen. Oh, well. And my parents let me read whatever I want. Yeah. Maybe some of that stuff was too scary. Like, uh, yeah. Like I read Sybil when I was in Israel in a kibbutz. And that's a whole <laughs> other story. <laughs> Anyway, okay. So, Judy, what did I forget to ask you that you wanted to talk about? I don't know. Can I ask you what's behind your head? What does that plate say? It says, truth you? be told. Whose plate is that? That is, I actually have, it's an artist. My friend who's an art dealer gave it to me for my 60th. Uh, oh, how nice. And, and then you put it in your son's room instead of displayed it out and like what I, anyone I else actually could see? took it. Because you said, I'm going to look at something behind you. And I said, I want that to be <laughs> behind me. Behind that is a painting of me as Carla, the crossing guard for the um, Apple TV's um, The Helpsters. It's like a, it's the Sesame uh, Street company. They have a, a show and I play Carla, the crossing guard. And in one of the episodes, someone paints a portrait of me. So I kept that portrait. So I brought those two things out. But you put them like like a vision test across the fucking room. I can't read that. All right. What do you want from me? And then that, that other one. <laughs> wait, where is it? I can go like that, right? Yeah. That, when when my son Henry, my older son, not the 6'8 son, my older son Henry, when I was a producer and writer on the Rosie O'Donnell show, and Madonna came on uh, as a guest with her, uh, Lourdes was about, a few weeks old and um, Henry and Lourdes, who ended up knowing each other in high school, but uh, Henry and Lourdes had the same due date, actually. And when she was coming on right after Lourdes's birth, every all the news outlets said she was bringing the baby and she wasn't. So Henry was the prop baby. So that's Madonna and Henry on the Rosie O'Donnell show. That's very exciting. Mm-hmm. Very exciting. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so now I gave you a little time to think about what I didn't ask you about besides the things behind you. What? I don't know. Okay, I have something else to ask you. Fine. I mean, Jesus Christ, aren't you going, like, aren't you going to be, like, momentarily camped out in Provincetown? Oh, right, yes. Street, we can talk about what I'm doing. So yes, when is this doing? airing, Jen Taub, professor? It's airing this fucking Sunday. I'm, I'm getting you ahead of the line. I can love you. you. Jen, uh, on, yes. on um, June 22nd, I'm in... Baltimore. I'm at Owings Mills, Maryland. Okay. At the Gordon Center for the Performing Arts. And then I do my residency at the Post Office Cabaret uh, in Provincetown. I'm doing Tuesday night, Thursday night, and Sunday night. And uh, over the summer is when I work out all my new material. 
uh, for the I'm year. I'm coming. I'm driving out. And you know, I'm in Western Mass. I'm coming where, out to you see you. You are? Where are you? I live in Northampton, Oh, dude. my God. You're such a lesbo. Well, I can't. Well, I, ha- I have to confess. I came out here with my female partner. Yeah. And we ha- and then later, I'm now married to a man. So, oh, you know. Oh, God. Ashonda, you're bi? I'm Ashonda. I don't like to use those terms. Yeah. I think everybody lives on a yes. spectrum. So I, wait, don't, I don't put myself in a box, honey. What did but Shelley I, Taub yeah. think when you had uh, a female partner? I thought so. Okay. I'm not doing, I didn't say a word. I didn't say a fucking word. I know. Well, it's silence. It's, uh, <laughs> um, silence speaks louder than words. <laughs> um, she, you know, she, yeah, she was fine. She's fine. She, well, now know, she's my, fine. Um, you got to stop with this. Mom, I love you. I love you, you Mrs. Great Taub. Mom. Um, and say hello to my Aunt Linda, her younger sister, who's going to listen to this before Aunt, Shelley Hi, does. Aunt Linda. Did, Linda Rawson. She's a doll. You'll did love Linda her. Ro- is Saratoga. Linda Rawson a Republican as well? Not at all. I love you, Linda. Oi, Aunt Linda. Kanahara, poo-poo. Poo-poo. I love you, Aunt Linda. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to the Montreal Comedy Festival as well. Ooh, and that's July. July no, so, 18 so like you, to the 28th. You, you take a sabbatical from your residency yes, in Provincetown. Yes, I have to. At the post office for the whole summer, you go to Montreal, which sounds exciting. Yeah, so, yeah. And I, I'm just so excited because I've been working on this show for so long, and I, you know, which is going to tour. Yes, I can say that. But I'm so excited to spend a few months really working on my stand-up because it's just the most gratifying thing to write a bit, and get on stage. And they laugh. Oh, it's the best. Well, because COVID shut all that shit down, yeah. so I'm glad you're back up and running. And yeah. by the way, for people who didn't like take notes on that, uh, you can find it at judygold.com, spelled J-U-D-Y, G-O-L-D, unlike her handles, which are spelled Jew. The, the, yeah, J-E-W-D-Y-G-O-L-D. But don't do that on the internet. It's it's actually J-U-D-Y-G-O-L-D. Yeah. And you can get my com. book. Where is my book? Oh. Did you even... Oh, should I get a copy of it? Well, we're not on video. Oh, right. What do you mean? So co- screw it. Yeah. And it's it's what's really I think that you should, should get do what I did, which is you get a hard copy and you get the audible book because oh, you get to love hear Judy the audible reading book. it. I love it. Thank you. I'd like to hear you and walk if, around with you in my ears. If you're one of those people who displays your books by color, uh it's a nice red. It's a nice red. So it'll go in the red section. Is that what you do with your books? No, that's why I actually um, rolled my eyes when I said that, but no one saw Oof. that. But there's nothing wrong. Just lo- no, nothing I think wrong with as long as you have books, fine. But the one thing that is wrong, Judy, I saw in some like home decorating ad or display, people turning their books the other way, so the spine is in, and all you see are the like, pa- you know, the why? edges of the pages. I, I actually think that's that's anti-Semitic uh, and wrong. <laughs> I mean, how do you find the book? What is, that is the stupidest thing I ever heard. But some people don't like the different colors. They wanted like a cool beige look, Judy. Okay. All right. Okay. They're really intellectual. Anyhow, it's, Not been, that I am, it's but. been great. And I'm sorry that you didn't bring Lucy on oh, set. Oh, Lucy the dog. What? Yeah. That's I mean, Eddie's Ponsu's dog. sitting here. What? It's Eddie's I it was dog. Your dog. No. <gasps> oh. Lucy's Eddie's dog, and Lucy is the best. Eddie who? Eddie Sarfati, who I. Oh, your co, yeah, your co writer. writer, my writing partner. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, fine. Are you a dog person or a cat Love. person? Before we go, Lo- I used to have cats during. Yeah. I had cats for, and I like cats, but I really, I can't with the kitty litter. It was just annoying the kitty litter, and then you go. And there's shit on the ground and yeah, no, I love dog. I love all animals, um, except for like rats and opossums, but, um, I love dogs and I want Okay, one, sorry. One last, and I don't have we one. can cut all that out. No, I'm kidding. Um, Hey, this one thing I am terrible at telling jokes, but the other, this is the other morning I, I read Michael, um, the joke you told about the, the kid going to school and getting the part in the play, but I don't want to mangle it. Could you remind me of that? Oh my God, go that's such an note. old joke. So uh, n- I know, but he never heard it and he laughed his fucking no head way. off. No way. Maybe because, yeah, so, well, think um, about it. Yeah. This uh, kid, the, a, young, a young Jewish boy goes to school, um, auditions for the play, goes home to his Jewish mother and says, guess what? 
I got a part in the school play. And the mother says, what are you, who are you playing? And he said, I'm playing the Jewish father. And she said, you go back there and ask for a speaking part. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like how much Michael laughed about uh, that. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judy. Jen, you're the best. Say hi to Shelly, but especially Linda, Aunt Linda. <laughs> and... Uh, As we say, so long. It was really great hearing Judy talk about free speech, comedy, and her latest escapades in Provincetown. And I'll be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. Send an email to bookedup at politicon.com. You can also write to us at Booked Up, P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find us.